So uh, thank you for inviting me to, to speak today, um, Natalie. We've had a, a, long, a long history with Twix sort of sending our wildlife sightings um, into, into them for, for, for many decades. Uh, just a little bit about me. I've been the trust manager with the Water Relief Conservation Trust for, uh, well, actually nearly 19 years to the day, actually, um, believe it or not. <laughs> um, prior to that, I used to work for Scottish Wildlife Trust uh, running the Jupiter Urban Wildlife Centre and just sort of prior to that um, I worked with SWT at the Falls of Clyde. It's always been about rivers for me. I grew up on a, a tributary of the Great Ooze down in Buckinghamshire um, and the river regularly used to flood into the field at the back of our house. Uh, so I've always played in rivers, got up into all kinds of scrapes. There was an old mill site uh, near where, where I lived um, and rivers have always inspired me. I studied uh, geography at the University of Leeds, where I very much focused on sort of, um, you know, floodplain management and river management uh, topics while I was there. Uh, so I have a, a very, very special affinity for, for all those wet places. So I guess it was only appropriate that I moved to Scotland. <laughs> so um, today what I've put together is um, a very sort of um, a basic overall of where the, the water of leaf flows and the kind of habitat it goes through. Um, and we're then going to have a little look at what makes the water of leaf a special place. It's sort of industrial heritage and it's natural heritage. And then I'll finish off with a look at the work that we do as an organisation with volunteers to look after this important natural asset for the city. Um, some areas, because of the sort of more... Um, probably interest of the, the group that I'm speaking to today probably lies more within the natural world than perhaps industrial archaeology. There are certain sections that I might gloss over uh, fairly, fairly quickly. Uh, but we'll, we'll start with a, a look at the river catchment um, in its entirety. So it starts way up here um, in the Pentland Hills. Uh, the sort of, uh, for those that know the Pentland Hills, this isn't really a section you've probably been to very often. Mia Lowther is the nearest summit um, and the Coliseum Springs is the area that's, that's named. We've had, uh, we've been quite fortunate uh, of late to do a number of walks along the whole catchment of the river and there's some fantastic mosses um in that upper area so if, it, if there's any moss people among you i highly recommend and you don't mind hiking through bulk for about four miles uh, <laughs> heading out and trying to find the the source we have actually dropped a pin on google earth so you can can find uh that original section so you see that uh initially the river flows into harper rig reservoir and then on into the city joined by the bay of Lorburn from the outfall of three Muir and harlow reservoir and then down through to its uh, its term, you know, where it enters the Firth of Forth at the harbour mouth in Leith. So these upper reaches, there's a nice boggy picture uh, for you. Um, in the, the the area here is the sort of um, origins of the the river. Uh, apparently, there's adders up there. Um, according to the signs, haven't actually seen the adders, adders myself. Um, I have drunk from the source of the water of Leith. Um, I can't necessarily say it's the fountain of all use, but Charlotte's drunk from it four or five times and she always seems like a total baby face to me. So maybe it does work for, for some. As it starts, it picks, it flows through this, this upland peat um, and picks up its very uh, characteristic orange color. Uh, which it carries on throughout its, um, its length. That upper section of Coliseum Springs flows into Harper Rig Reservoir. Um, so just a few images of Harper Rig Reservoir here. Again, not probably one of the most commonly visited reservoirs. It, it can be quite interesting to pop up there, particularly at the, the time of year when the geese are always moving around. There's good flocks of geese um, up in that area. Um, but don't choose a windy day because it is very bleak up there. It's really rather open and there's not a lot to... To, uh, to prevent the wind catching you. Then the section we sort of call the, the upper catchment, the river is still fairly small here. Um, it flows through a lot of uh, agricultural land, largely upland grazing. There's been small amount of, of tree planting work, some exclusion from the margins of the river uh, for, for cattle and, um, and sheep. Um, 
and then as it heads a little bit more towards habitation there is some rural agricultural land as well but it's mostly unimproved grassland in that upper catchment area. Then the river flows into Balerno uh, where it's joined by the Bay of Lorburn which as I said flows out of Threepmere and Harlow Reservoir. Now it's really a river before that it's very much a burn it's not not particularly substantial and you could kind of two strides and you're across it. In Balerno it becomes much more of a uh, substantial river this is a strain of milling villages for those that aren't familiar with the, with the area. There's some lovely sort of traditional spots to them, but really we're beginning the urban sprawl of Edinburgh. Then we head into Collington and the Dells. Uh, the Dells is probably the sort of jewel, the natural jewel in the water of Leith's crown, if you like. It's an area of ancient woodland, uh, tremendous diversity of, of tree, uh, bird and plant life uh, in the Dells. Uh, so well worth uh, an investigation. And uh, you're only sort of three miles out of the city centre, but you really do feel like you could be in the middle of the, the, the countryside. Uh, again, on this area, you, you see quite a lot of the, the echoes of its industrial past. Then the river flows under the Lanark Road for the first time and passes the Water of Leith Visitor Centre. Uh, that's the same backdrop as I've got here. And this very much marks another change in the, the river from sort of a rural character to feeling much more urban. From here, we're, you know, we're Asda, we're Sainsbury's, we're the allotments, we're the prison. Um, we're on Togorgie Road, Chester, Sockton Park. It feels much more like you're, you're in a city river rather than a, a sort of rural idyll. Uh, it's just a, a couple of those that haven't been to Sockton Park lately. Um, it's undergone a, a, a huge transformation and it's well worth a visit and has a new micro hydro scheme um, with an Archimedes style screw um, on it. Um, this is a sort of image here of, uh, of it um, as it was being put in uh, to the Gorgie Weir, but it's, it's definitely a very interesting part and it's part of the sort of green revolution of Sockton Park where they're trying to use entirely renewable uh, sources to power the park. Then we head to Murrayfield and Roseburn Park. This area has been probably the most extensively modified by the recent flood prevention scheme. Um, in the bottom corner here we've got original flood defence schemes which were sort of channelising the river um, with concrete sides. Now we have a, a broad two-stage channel um, with a, a bund and an embankment or a levee if you if you prefer uh, style arrangement um, which is the new the new way to to protect the stadium and the surrounding uh, properties from flooding. Then we head down into Belford and Dean Village, very much uh, the industrial heartland of the river. Uh, it was a, a heavily milled area. Uh, the Dean Valley, Dean Village itself had 11 mills. It had uh, a tannery, um, a skin works, a brewery and a distillery, all very uh, much in a, in a less than a mile area of the river. So very intensely um, industrialized that section. Down to Stockbridge, uh, probably fairly people. Um, we've got uh, two diff different eras of statues here. We've got so the Anthony Gormley statue um, and the statue of Hygieia, um, the goddess of, of health and hygiene, sitting atop St, St. Bernard's well. Um, again, the walkway follows here and onto the, the colonies. Then down to Cannon Mills, Warriston, and St. Mark's Park, another section which has been extensively. Um, modified for um, flooding uh, but it's now recovering very well as you can see from this image here when they built the flood defense works they in this area they had to build it from inside the river so they essentially had to build a road up the middle of the river in order to put the piling machinery into uh, this section um, so it caused you know obviously a huge amount of damage to, to the environment there um, which I'm thankful is is recovering nicely as you can see from these these other pictures of the area. Down towards uh, Red Braes and Bonnington we're right down at the bottom end of the river now uh, but you can see it still retains some element of, of rural character and then we're right down at the bottom end um, in Leith. 
um, where the river is impounded from the docks, um, it's no longer tidal, and you get this, this sort of very slow uh, moving water until it enters into leaf docks. So that's a very quick whistle stop tour down the water of Leith for those that aren't familiar with it. Um, the things that make the water of Leith a special place, uh, well, it was absolutely key to the development of Edinburgh as a city. Uh, they often say that Edinburgh is built on the three Bs, um, books, banking, and you can either say beer or biscuits um, for the other, the other B. Uh, but obviously the book and the banking industry relies heavily on paper and leather and glue to make ledgers um, and books and bind those things together. All of those um, products were, were, were created in mills on the banks of the Water of Leith, paper mills being particularly uh, prevalent in the upper stream sections. Uh, you can actually trace the milling history back to the 11th century along the Water of Leith. And this is an old slide here, which has some of the dates of existing mills on the river. So you can see one here, Walk Mill, um, 1376, um, and that's um, up near, near Belerno. And then there's Whole Mill here, 1226, uh, um, which was down near what is now Collington Kirk um, in, um, in Collington. So a tremendous and long um, history of milling on the, the water of Leith. It uh, produced a range of good, not just the paper and the glue um, that I've, I've mentioned, but cloth, obviously ground snuff, spices, uh, was the, the, the sole producer of Scots porridge oats for about 50 years. The Cox's Glue Factory at Gorgie Mills um, was there. And the other image here we've got is of the Kinleith Mill Complex, uh, which was a huge, um, paper mill complex um, up near Curry, and that produced, I think at one point, a quarter of all the paper used in Scotland. Um, so it was a, a very, a very large concern. Other mills were tiny. This is East Grain Snuff Mill. Um, and in fact, just on the, the sort of snuff uh, grinding um, issue, we've recently been donated a snuff grinding uh, crucible. Uh, which we've put out in our yard outside the visitor centre. So if anyone's, if anyone's passing and wonders what that rusty metal structure is, that's what it is. Uh, so one of our jobs is the preservation of this industrial and cultural heritage of the river. We have a book that was written um, quite a few years ago now on the water mills of the Water of Leith, and we like to try and preserve the, the heritage and some of the features of the river whilst balancing uh, the naturalness. There are a number of relics uh, of this history along the river, which we like to see preserved, lades, um, millstones. This is a, an old uh, kiln, in uh, grain kiln in curry and a section of, of water, uh, a, a wheel set into a lade. Uh, this is at Bonninghoff Lane down in, in Bonnington. Um, so they're so littered up and down the, the river. Uh, another great story from the, the milling history is um, Dean Valley and the Great Laid. This is quite a familiar view uh, down um, the Dean Valley from sort of literally where Dean Bridge is down towards uh, St George's Well and then St Bernard's Well. And you just think about how densely vegetated that valley is today. Um, and it looks sort of sterile and there's probably a very good reason for that because at that point the the river was also Edinburgh's main sewer um, and you know it was probably foul and very very polluted so that the diversity of this this river was probably very very low at that time. The Great Laid started at uh, what we call World's End Weir which is the lower of the two big weirs in Dean Village and ran all the way to Cannon Mills. You can see from the map here um, from the village of the Water of Leith, which is what the Dean Village used to be called. The Laid ran all the way here uh, down to, to Cannon Mills. Okay. Um, sorry, let's go back one. Um, and, uh, and this powered all the mills of Stockbridge, uh, Silver Mills and Cannon Mills. Um, it was closed as one of the first um, acts of trying to, to improve Edinburgh after major cholera outbreaks, uh, because 
it was a basically a, a trough holding raw sewage at often head height uh, going towards the, the, you know, through a populated area of the city and at the edge of the, the new town. Um, so they, they closed it and single-handedly sort of wiping out the industry um, from Dean Village downstream and enabling that further expansion and gentrification that happened uh, throughout sort of Stockbridge um, and Cannon Mills area. It's a, a fascinating story and you can actually trace the, the route of the Great Laid through um, sort of ditches and place names and all kinds of other things um, along, along that area, but it is another great story. Uh, there are many other stories, social and cultural stories along the Water of Leith, uh, areas of design landscape, areas of gardens, um, areas of recreation. This is image here of St Bernard's Well, inside and out. Um, and this is one of the grottos up in uh, Craig Lockhart Dell, uh, which is, it was used as a, as a pleasure garden. So people have, even though it was Edinburgh's main sewer um, and an industrial part, people have always seen the attraction and the charm of this essentially sort of uh, potentially be quite beautiful area. Uh, one of the other main oops, air, um, elements of interest along the river, which was uh, part of its history, was the Belerno Branch Railway Line, which was opened in 1874, uh, closed to passengers after the, the Second World War, uh, but continued on dealing in freight until the 1960s, uh, which really shows that the milling industry supported by the railway continued to be viable where a lot of mills um, closed. It was a tremendously expensive branch line to, to be created. Um, a lot of the rock um, that it had to go through had to be excavated by hand um, and there was a lot of embankments and cuttings that need to be needed to be made. Uh, the route of the Belerno Branch Railway is now that up section of the Water of Leith walkway from Belerno to Slateford, nice broad path. And again, you can see this sort of echoes of the, 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 the Belerno Branch uh, Railway line there in the environment around you. So again, it shaped the landscape, uh, but also shaped the future of the river by giving us this opportunity for a, for a broad cycle path. Another story along the river and something to keep your eye out for when you're when you're uh, traveling down is the bridges, fords and crossings. Often the place names along the river give you uh, an idea to this. We're at the visitor center is in Slateford, which is um, named after the slate like rock that they use to ford the river in Slateford. Um, downstream from us is Longstone, where they used a long stone to go across the water, uh, where the Murray Burn joins it. And in Stockbridge, they had a bridge made out of stocks, which is just large chunks of wood, basically, which formed a very uh, basic and very dangerous bridge that frequently got washed away. All these villages, all these crossings, often uh, they are focused around a bridge, beautiful old bridge in Curry, Dean Village, um, Collington. Often they started with a ford, uh, a smaller bridge and then something much grander and again there's a lots of lovely stories wrapped up in um, these these bridges. I particularly like that view of Dean Bridge which isn't something you can really see nowadays because of uh, the vegetation and, 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 uh, and private properties but you can see just what a valley and what a feat of engineering that that bridge is and how beautiful it is. It was designed by, by Telford um, but I think even more atmospheric shows you what the Dean Village used to look like at that time. Very much an industrial slum, really. Uh, very unattractive. And one of the reasons for the Dean Bridge being built was that uh, it, before you had to skitter down Bells Bray in your carriage and across the small Dean Bridge back up the other side. And they said that you'd come out covered in a ghostly shadow from all the dust that came out of the grain mills in Dean Village. Um, so gives you an idea of what was sort of swirling around in the atmosphere fear down there um, at the time. Uh, this is a, a great old image of Sandport Place Bridge uh, down at the bottom end of the river in Leith. This is now permanently impounded, has been since the 60s, um, but this shows the tidal extent going um, underneath 
the, the bridge there. Uh, nowadays, I think the water would pretty much stay at this sort of height. I hope you can see my cursor moving across. Oops, sorry. Moving across. Um, and this is the depth, largely filled up with silt uh, nowadays. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's wonderful to see, see that old image. I think this is from about the 1920s. Uh, oh, no, 1910, it says there at the bottom. Leeds obviously has a whole wealth of stories um, itself. In fact, Sandy at the moment is working on a presentation it, itself um, about the, the, the history of Leith and how it relates to the, to the river. Um, you can see the big complex of docks, the, the, the swing bridge here, which we really consider to be the end of the, the water of Leith. Uh, you can see there's quite a significant journey for the water to go through to actually get out through the tidal weir here and the, the gates um, and exit out into the fourth. For those that um, sort of often think about migratory fish, um, this is the main barrier to salmon and migratory fish entering the water of Leith is this dock gates um, here. So any animal, uh, any fish rather, wanting to, to get up into the, the water of Leith would first have to um, be there at the right time for that gate to be open in order to, uh, to come in and then find its way um, through the, the complex of docks um, and up the, the water of Leith. Then obviously there's a lot of barriers. Uh, the two main weirs the, being the ones in the middle of Dean Village uh, being sort of 14 foot and vertical are significant barriers to, to fish migration. Um, and then further upstream there, are, there are, are, are many others as well. Uh, the, the route of the river is followed from Belerno to, to Leith. Uh, by the Water of Leith Walkway, 12 and three quarter miles, um, if you're interested. So there and back, virtually a marathon, um, which, is, uh, which, is, which is quite tall order. Um, but it was uh, pretty much completed um, in 2002 um, and um, with funding from, from Millennium Commission and various small sections have been improved and added to since. Here's a rough overview of the route uh, sort of from the, the southwest to the northeast of the city and kind of roughly halfway along is the Water of Leith Visitor Centre, which is where we have our base. A couple of new additions to the walkway. I've mentioned Sockton Park, um, but the old railway tunnel in Collington, if you haven't been there, this is the perfect lockdown activity. Uh, do go and see it. It's absolutely amazing. It's uh, the story of Robert Louis Stevenson's From a Railway Carriage poem um, illustrated on the walls through, uh, as you can see, sort of street style art um, and also art from the, the local community um, and local high schools. It's just an absolute joy um, to, 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 to brighten up any, any day. So that's a very quick snapshot of the human history uh, of the Water of Leith. Um, I now want to sort of focus much more on the, the natural history. Um, I started with this sort of picture of uh, Bells Mill Weir. This is my favourite spot on the Water of Leith. It's sort of only what, a half an hour from Haymarket Station and yet you're surrounded by birdsong. All you can hear is running water and you're right in the heart of the city. Um, this is what makes the river a special place. I think brought sharply into focus this year um, as many people's little patch of countryside right on their doorstep, somewhere they can, you know, go for a walk, they can cycle, they can go fly fishing, they can bird watch, they can photograph um, things, they can relax um, and they can find um, their, own, their own space. It's, um, I think, us um, on the Water of Leith from Slateford downstream, you can see streamwater crowfoot in the river. Uh, this sort of green hair-like plant is a member of the ranunculus family, so buttercup family. Uh, people often think it's weed and algae choking the water, but it's actually an indicator of, of, of clean, fast-flowing rivers, which uh, the Water of Leith thankfully is today. Uh, we've got water ravens there, some water forget-me-nots, some cuckoo flower and some, some soft rush um, as well. 
Uh, it's not just the aquatic plants. I think we did this when we did the survey of aquatic plants. There was 54 different. Once we'd done that survey, then we then turned our attention to the to the banks of the river um, and looked at the woodland environment and the grassland. Um, and over the last um, well, probably about 10 years ago now, we did an initial wildflower survey. Um, we discovered 250 different species of flowering wild plant. Um, and then we redid that survey sort of over the last sort of two years, um, increasing that list even further by another, I think, nearly 40 species uh, of plant. Uh, they, the plants that we've discovered, what, because the volunteers were walking sections of, of the river on a monthly basis, recording things as they were coming into flower. And I think over time, we just got better at recording and spotting things. Um, so I suspect the plants were all, always there, um, but, uh, but just the, the, the recording. So we're hoping to nearly top 300 different species. So if there's any of you that are, are botanically minded and want to test yourself, uh, you don't have to go very far. Uh, we can always furnish you with a, a list of the species that, that we've found and you can almost use it like a checklist to see if um, you, can, you can discover the same variety. So the woodlands, obviously here we've got um, Herb Robert and Foxgloves, Lords and Ladies, Dog Violets, um, and there are lovely patches of native bluebell, particularly in Collington Dell. Unfortunately, there's a lot of Spanish in, in many other areas. We have summer meadows, a lot of which we've been working on um, to improve as well. Here we've got some Bloody Cranesbill, Devil's Bit Scabious, um, Forget Me Not, and I'm not sure what type of buttercup that is but it's definitely a buttercup um, and uh, I'll talk a little bit more about our meadow work as we as we go on it's not all um, roses in the garden uh, we have a fair amount of invasive species on the the river we have a fair amount of just non-native uh, species on the river some of which we actively manage some of which you know we're perfectly happy to live in in harmony with um, again, I'll talk much more about how we work <coughs> to um, eradicate certain invasive species um, a little bit later on. Okay, moving on up the, the food chain a little bit. Uh, there are many different um, invertebrates in the river. Um, mayflies, stoneflies, um, freshwater shrimp, caddisfly larvae. Um, under normal circumstances, we're out there river dipping with, with, with children on an almost daily basis, uh, being able to, to track the health of, of, of the river uh, <coughs> by making sure that there's plenty of, uh, of invertebrates uh, there for the, the various species of fish to eat. So we've got a list there of the fish species, brown trout, minnow, stickleback, stone loach, eel, lamprey, grayling, bullhead. Um, and these other ones here are much more interlopers from other environments. So brown trout escaping from the reservoirs, uh, perch and pike probably escaping from the Union Canal, um, and salmon uh, coming up from the, the upper reaches of the river. And again, there's been some flounder um, spotted in the, the, the lower regions. Um, Lamprey are a really interesting species of fish to, to see um, with an amazing mouth part. Um, and it's always uh, uh, fascinating when you discover eels as well. In fact, the Fourth um, Rivers Trust have just sort of employed an eel expert. Um, so we've been learning, learning quite a bit about eels and eel habitat, um, you know, in the last, last year or so. Um, the, the first time I saw an eel on the water of Leith, we were actually down at the, the Leith end and I was, there was a, a child's buggy in the river and I was using a grappling hook to try and hook the buggy and, and pull it out. Um, and there was a number of us and we took it ages and ages. Anyway, we managed to hook it and we pulled it out and we dumped it on the ground and we we're like, yay! And then out from the tubing of the, the buggy um, slithered an eel. Um, and we all out absolutely freaked out and ran away screaming because just somehow it felt like it was going to be a snake or something even though magically it was an eel um so that was that was and it was huge it was it was nearly i would say well, probably about two two and a half feet um long so uh, so it was really really quite uh, quite surprising um fish if you've got plenty of fish you've got the fish eating birds we have many many wonderful pictures of the herons uh, along the water of leaf and quite a lot of wonderful images like the one there of it uh, 
um, chowing down on some, some healthy sized trout. Other birds you can see, dippers, uh, pretty much continuous dipper territories all the way down, uh, particularly the urban stretches of the river, very characterful birds and down, um, going under the, the rocks and stones for, for, for invertebrates and small fish, uh, can be very quite argumentative as well. Uh, so if you see a rock kind of covered in um, what looks like someone splattered paint all over it, um, you know, chances are that's a sort of edge of a, of a dipper territory. So, um, you know, keep, keep your eye on it and one might, uh, might just, uh, uh, you know, pop into view. The kingfisher is uh, probably the most popular bird. We were talking about that just while we were waiting everyone, for everyone to, to, to join us. Um, there are around three nesting pairs of kingfishers on the river. They do fairly well. They have mixed success in breeding. Interestingly, it's the lower pairs that uh, have more success. Um, I'm not entirely sure why, but there's, there's, there's good, you know, kingfisher grounds and habitat and plenty of overhanging branches um, in other areas. But I think it's the viability of the nesting sites that, um, um, and because the, they like sort of pretty much vertical banks with excavatable, um, you know, um, areas to, to get in and out that can't be uh, predated at all. So, uh, but always fantastic if you see uh, the kingfisher on the river, oh, sorry. Okay, other bird life uh, you can expect to see, you do see coots and moorhens, gray wagtails, ducks, swans up and down the river, uh, but it's a small fast flowing river. So there isn't a huge variety of uh, bird life. Uh, it's quite a tough place to live. Um, if the river levels are likely to go up by a metre and a half in a matter of hours. Uh, so the bottom end of the river and the basin areas at least from bird point of view. And in fact, um, you can end up with things like um, mandarin duck down at the bottom end, which is always quite, uh, quite amusing to see. But rather like the plants, it's not just what's in the river that's important. There are many other birds um, in this corridor, this, this, this river of, of green uh, going down the river and I think we have our bird species list uh, tops about 78 uh, different species of bird obviously not all seen <laughs> every year um, but uh, but it, it is particularly good for songbirds um, along the river in areas like the dells um, can be very rewarding uh, for seeing things like sparrowhawks and tawny owls. Um, moving, keep it on going, mammals, um, all kinds of different mammals using the river. Um, foxes and squirrels, obviously you would expect uh, to see them in an urban area using the, the corridors very effectively. There's a lot of badgers um, on the river as well, particularly in the Warriston area around Belford and the Gallery of Modern Art and then the area upstream. Um, of the city bypass. Curry in particular is like badger heaven. Um, you can kind of be chotling on the walkway and see them, them there. From Collington Dell upstream you can also see roe deer but we actually have records of roe deer pretty much everywhere on the river including down in Leith um, which is phenomenal. I have a picture of one prancing over the green space in front of Ocean Terminal and uh, the Scottish Government which God only knows where that one came from. Bat life, um, and mostly pipistrelle, but also you do get wonderful sightings of dorbentons um, along the river, which are lovely large bats uh, that like to, um, you know, obviously hunt across the surface of the, the water. Um, and in fact, we have a series of, of bat boxes um, and have been doing bat surveys with the Lothian Bat um, um, Conservation Trust for, for oh God, probably about 20 years now, keeping an eye on, on the populations there. Um, undoubtedly our, our oh, I shouldn't really say favourite, that's, that's not really appropriate, um, but undoubtedly my favourite animal of all time is the otter. Uh, we've had a, a resident female um, on the river for about five years now, the same female. Um, the otters returned in in the urban context, probably a 
about 12, 13 years ago now. Um, prior to that, there was a male dog otter that used to frequent the upper reaches of the river. Uh, we had a lot of mink in the city stretch. Um, and then slowly over time, the otter sightings um, began to sort of switch. You know, normally we'd have like 50 mink sightings and two otter sightings a year, and then it would switch to 50 otter sightings and two mink sightings. Um, and in the last three years, it's just exploded. I mean, one scroll through Twitter um, or Instagram on otters and the water of leaf uh, will bring you up but literally dozens um, and many other sites across the city um, as well of, of, of otter populations doing super well. Um, this is our, our resident female. She's looking like she's had a nice little manicure job there. Obviously. Um, and last year she successfully managed to rear three cubs. Uh, this is her with, with all three of them um, looking into the river, obviously teaching them how to fish. And this year um, she looks like she's just got one, but that picture there I just absolutely adore. The, 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 she looked, this, this, the colour of them and um, the, the, the quality of the fur, they both look um, really uh, fit um, and healthy. So having you know, this opportunity to, to see otters in an urban area, there's no doubt that this time of year is the best without any vegetation on the, the, the trees. Um, and there are certain places where people can almost guarantee that they're going to see the otter of, a, of an evening um has been you know uh, tremendously valuable and you know we hope that, that the level of disturbance um you know hasn't hasn't put them off we have occasionally uh, found dead otters um on the river and we've each time we've managed to um get them autopsied and it's usually young it's usually male um and it's usually died of what they call an inability to thrive uh, which basically means that it, it it hasn't been able to feed itself properly, uh, particularly when a, 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 an otter has a number of cubs like this, the mother will um, focus on rearing her females and encourage her male cubs to leave home because she just can't cope, you know, they're the teaching them all how to fish and there's not enough habitat um, to, to support that many otters so they get kind of chased off the territory and unfortunately that's when they can uh, not find enough food or end up encountering cars or dogs or, or other urban um hazards um i have mentioned already um issues around um mink um and how interestingly because anecdotally i mean the, there's been a lot of people saying you know once uh, you know once you have uh, otters resident then you know they won't tolerate mink um, in their, their environment and this definitely seems to be the case uh, with the water of leaf. The mink population took a, a huge nose dive uh, when our, our resident female took up um, and you know the levels have fed, fed, stayed fairly fairly low um, since then as well. For those that aren't that familiar with the difference between an otter and a mink, unfortunately, I can't seem to get rid of that top toolbar. I'm not sure why. Um, but the, the mink are usually much darker coloured, much more either grey, silvery. Um, oh, yes, Jenny, you've, yeah. <laughs> um, um, Je Jennifer's raved her hand. I don't know, did you have something you wanted to ask, Jennifer? Just unmute yourself. No. Wait, wait okay. till the end, Helen. Okay, fine. Just wait. <laughs> we'll wait till the end. Um, uh, yes, they're often often darker in colour and have got a much more sort of weaselly pointy uh, snout where the otters is much more sort of rounded and, and dog-like. Uh, they are much bigger, generally speaking, the otter, but if you get a young otter and a large mink, sometimes that's not always the, the clearest uh, difference. The large fat chunky tail um, is, a, is a good uh, is a good indication as well okay so I'm going to now just turn my attention to what we do as an organization um, I think people often look back on the history of the the water of leaf uh, with sort of rose tinted spectacles almost uh, I think often people do when they think about their their youth um, and they imagine 
themselves fishing or playing in it as youngsters um, and you know the sort of rural rural idyll I think the reality is probably a little bit more like this um, neglected buildings burnt out industrial complexes an awful lot of fly tipping litter and debris in the 70s, there was an organization called the Walkway Trust, and they were very keen on opening up access along the river. And they did a tremendous amount of work. A lot of the cast iron signs that you see up and down the walkway um, was the doing of the, the, the uh, Walkway Trust. And, uh, and they, um, they, they did a, 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 a great piece of work there. But unfortunately, the river was still hugely neglected. Um, so there were sort of two forces coming into being. One was uh, local people trying to galvanize volunteer effort to clean up the river. And then in Slateford, there was a couple uh, trying to create a local, local heritage museum. And these two sort of factions came together uh, and the Water Relief Conservation Trust was born. Um, very early projects, uh, we produced a guide to the walkway and some interpretation plans and crucially the first sort of integrated action plan um, for the river. Um, and they made a cake, Look at that wonderful cake there. <laughs> we didn't have one of those when we launched the latest management plan. The organisation took a huge uh, leap forward around the time of the millennium when we were awarded a £5 million uh, millennium lottery grant to complete the Water of Leith walkway, produce, create the Water of Leith Vista Centre and many other projects uh, spread up and down um, the, the, the Water of Leith, that's the, the Vista Centre as a, as a shell. A couple of years ago we had our um, um, anniversary, 30 years. Um, and that's just some of the facts and figures of, of, of what we've done over the years. Uh, 4, uh, so 1,418 conservation tasks and cleanups, uh, 3,700 school and learning sessions, <coughs> 128,000 volunteers hours. Um, so we've, we've done a lot um, as one of the first river charities to be set up. These are a list of our aims. Uh, so to raise awareness, lifelong learning service, um, encourage the protection and enhancement of biodiversity, practical conservation action, promote the walkway and work in partnership with others to promote the effective management of the river. The Vista Centre is undoubtedly the focus of that um, activity. Um, <laughs> it says open seven days, we haven't been open since, uh, since the end of December, but, uh, um, we're, we're undergoing a little bit of a face at the moment to, to, to improve the sort of cafe facilities because T and a P has become very, very important to the, the walkway users and we still have a small interactive exhibition space there, um, which you can see here. Um, we do all kinds of learning activities on the river from nursery stage all the way up to secondary school education and we also run fun um, programs from duck races to you know Roman reenactments to finding Neverland to mill workers to you know you you name it we've we've dressed up as it and, and done it along the water of Leith in a, in a bid to engage people in the, the history and the wildlife of the river. Uh, we teach about 160 school and community groups annually, um, but we're probably most known for our volunteer team. Um, they help us to run the Vista Centre um, and administration and, and operate the trust, but by far the biggest involvement is actually in the river um, and on the walkway. We do spend, we started pulling out rubbish from the river and we can continue to do that uh, to this day. Uh, it makes the river look polluted and neglected. It comes from lazy littering, bad neighborhoods. And if we don't pick it up, you get this big sea of rubbish down in Leith. Sorry. Sorry, that was my phone, very rude. Um, so we have many volunteer groups that go out through the, throughout the year um, and pick up all the rubbish from in the river and on the banks. We do some clearance of, of woody debris as well, um, just where it, it gets caught up on structures and is likely caught to cause uh, damage or, or flood risk. Um, other than that, we do try and um, leave it in situ. Um, goodness only knows what we pull out of the river. The hashtag not your usual rubbish is um, very, very common. This was a, a hot tub that we pulled out 
um, at the end of last year. There's a unicorn. We've had an urn with a lady's ashes in it. We've had sets of false teeth. We, you name it, we've found it um, in the water of Leith, and we never, never failed to be surprised about what we uh, we might get out. Um, over the, the last uh, few last year or so, we've we've uh, pulled together a, a new a basin agreement for uh, litter at the bottom end of the river. Uh, this this fox did survive; it just got exhausted trying to faddle out on the rubbish to, to chase the ducks. Um, but now we do a monthly clean up in a boat to pull um, the litter out of the, the woody debris that accumulates at the bottom end there. And then when the woody debris is built up, that is then taken away um, by fourth ports. Um, you know, so it doesn't sort of enter the, the docks. Um, in a way, this is great because it prevents this rubbish from becoming a marine issue. Most um, marine rubbish comes from riparian environments, so from rivers. Um, and it's only the fact that we've got this boom across the river that prevents it going into the docks to cause a hazard for shipping that we can actually have this opportunity to get the rubbish out before it comes um, into the, the rubbish and just um, into the, the basin and into the sea. You just see how many balls we get there. There's an awful lot of lazy Labradors out there that don't manage to get there, retrieve their balls um, is what I think. We work with conservation, our conservation volunteers, youth groups, community groups and corporate partners to deliver all these tasks along the river. A lot of drainage ditches being cleared. We have been doing habitat creation projects for, for many years, um, managing meadow lands, um, collecting seed, growing on plants, raking, scarifying, plug planting, trying to sort of um, maintain a diversity of, of environments along the river uh, from these, these meadow lands um, and also creating small garden projects up and down the river. We have one in Belerno. This is one at St Bernard's Well. Uh, medicinal herb garden there and we fairly recently put one in at Bal Green sort of converting a, a sort of the corner of, uh, of nothing really which just used as a turning circle into quite a nice uh, community garden project that was funded by Tesco's Bags for Help. Invasive species has been a focus for probably about the last 14-15 years uh, this is when we, we first got staff trained up with the, the safe use of pesticides by water uh, to support the treatment of um, giant hogweed along the river, which was, was getting out of hand. We also hand pull Himalayan balsam and the last three years we've had a huge concerted effort to, to try and um, reduce the impact of this part along the river. Um, and we feel like we're making some headway, um, but we put an awful lot of the, you know, with survey information to back it up, how we can um, hopefully make this, um, this, this invasive plant less of a threat and allow the, the native vegetation to, to return. Um, la I think we're probably just about to head into year four of a, of a research project into trying to find a way to reduce the use of glyphosate on the treatment of Japanese knotweed and giant hogweed. This is a study we're doing with Napier University. We have quadrats set up um, and all the plants are individually GPS marked and located along the river. Uh, they are also treated, um, but then within the quadrats, we're treating the plants in four different ways. Um, and we're also investigating how the plant life recovers after the treatment with the glyphosate. Um, they're hoping to get some early findings um, from the project soon and we're hoping that this will, will, will feed into you know, perhaps national strategies for the use of glyphosate um, along particularly along water courses and how it, how it treats, um, how, how we treat hogweed in particular with it. Uh, this, is a, this is a heat map that we produced this year with regards to where the giant hogweed plants are and you can see there's a huge concentration uh, just downstream from the visitor centre in Slate and you think that's very odd, why, why there? Well basically the Murray burn comes in 
um, from the sort of Calder Junction and the Harriet Watt University area joins the Water of Leith here. Um, and that is where you know, this hot spot um, is coming from. And we recently followed the catchment up and discovered there's a farmer's field about here, which is just almost purely hogweed, which is unbelievable. And it's probably the, 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 the from here downstream, there's the single most source of, of hogweed um, on the water of Lee. So all the work that we could have carried on doing here might have ended up being, you know, for nothing if we hadn't been able to go out. So hopefully we can go out and get this area treated um, this year. So it's very exciting, um, the hogweed work that, that, that we're doing on the river catchment. Uh, there are many other things that we do. We do willow spiling projects, fencing projects, putting in benches, interpretation, um, signs, steps, railings, you name it. Uh, we're forever trying to drain out puddles as well. Um, but this is the, the work that we do with the volunteers right across the city. We also have a system of, of volunteer patrollers, surveys and biological recording. This is how we know about all the, the, the plant species study done recently, which was looking at the um, diet of the otter in the urban area and what species they're eating. And we're hoping that, the, the, that I think that, that dissertation is being published very soon. So she was, this is her, this is her sprint lab, uh, which was in her, her spare bedroom which isn't particularly pleasant. Thank you to Lockdown Learning uh, for that one. Um, when you have to have a, a sprint lab um, in your house. Um, but in the next, well, last year and, and this year, we're also um, hoping to survey the trout spawning habitat uh, in the river as well, looking at the viability so that if any work was done in the future to look at the impact of removing barriers to fish migration we'd be able to pinpoint where the potential good habitat is and what areas of um, uh, river you know where the greatest benefits should resources be spent in that way uh, to the fish habitat could be and we've also been involved in a number of sort of fish rescues um, and electrofishing surveys along the river as well which is always very exciting um, I can't let you read the, the top Sorry, of that Helen. but uh, basically it's a Oh, yeah. Sorry, Helen, I was just going to say we're about a bit, bit, bit over time now, so if you could wrap up, that'd be great. Oh, are we? Oh, well, I'm, ne Sorry, I'm nearly there. I'm nearly there. Um, so, yeah, this is a sort of, you know, we, we, what we, we do a lot of, uh, of, of every year, lots of, of different activities and lots of uh, practical hours. Um, you can follow us on, on social media, have a look at uh, what, what in interested and innovative um projects we do. One of the final things that I just wanted to talk a little bit about was the issues and stakeholders on the river. Being an urban river there are a lot of pressures and demands placed on the river. Works of art, um, hydro-powered schemes, um, wildlife, fishing, you know, mink, invasive species, events, activities, humans, um, and there's a management plan for the river which you can look at on the management pages of our website. Uh, which focuses on the water, the habitat, the species, the recreation, the engagement, education, heritage, landscape, geodiversity, planning, development and resilience to climate change. And all these topic areas have actions uh, to deliver within them. So if you want to know any more about the river, then that management plan is a great place to start. Um, the Water of Leith, as I've briefly mentioned, was also Edinburgh's main sewer and it's absolutely crisscrossed here. And you have CSOs um, and the strain on Edinburgh sewer network is, uh, is, is palpable um, for the Water of Leith and some of the work that's going on in the up, uh, upstream of Slate is to improve the CSOs uh, so less of this, this sewage outfalls will hopefully happen uh, for the river. Flooding has been a perennial problem for the river as well. Um, it's hugely urban catchment, so the water levels shoot up and down very, very quickly. It now has a flood defence scheme, which has been a big impact and really only higher walls are not hugely innovative, uh, but it is at least protecting properties um, at the moment. Every developer worth his salt has got his BDI on patches of, of, uh, of land by the river as well, so the planning and development pressures um, are still very, very prevalent. So I'm just finishing off uh, with a, a little thank you. 
um, to the City of Edinburgh Council. I mean, often people blame everything that goes wrong with the river on the council. Um, but they don't own most of the river. There are well over a thousand different landowners that own patches of the Water of Leith and it's important that we bring all that work together um, and we're very grateful to have had the council's support uh, for so many years. And that's me. <laughs>